What's up, wizards? This is Michael Beeson with Hacking Fate. I wanted to take the opportunity to slip into this video before it really got started, uh, because when Chris and I initially had the conversations that would become um, this series of videos, we didn't really have a name for it. So we wanted to come up with something that was was a bit snappy and really kind of worked um, and described what this was. Well, Chris pointed out that aphorism derives from the Greek, which means horizon, and recommended that we call this series Across the Horizon, um, Astrological Wisdom and the 100 Aphorisms Attributed to Ptolemy. It's a little bit long for a title card, but I will totally try to make it work. In the meantime, if you haven't already, please go ahead and give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. If you're watching it on Renaissance Astrology, um, hop over to Hacking Fate and do the same. And if you're watching it on Hacking Fate, hop over and do the same for Renaissance Astrology. We both have similar content, but there's enough difference there to keep you guys entertained and informed. So without further ado, onward to Across the Horizon, Episode 1, The Introduction to Ptolemy's Centiloquium. What's up, wizards? Welcome to another Renaissance Astrology and Hacking Fate collaboration. I'm Michael Beeson of Hacking Fate, and with me is Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology. And we're going to be discussing the Centiloquium, or Liber Fructus. Fru fructus? I'm horrible with Latin. How is it pronounced, Chris? I think Liber Fructus. All right. Or the Book of Fruit. <laughs> awesome. And that is 100 aphorisms that are attributed to Ptolemy, though Ptolemy himself did not write them. So um, this is the introduction. We'll be going over this, and then we'll be going over each of these and discussing them because I am way too anal to group these into any cohesive groups. So this is going to be quite a long haul for us. Yeah, we won't be doing it all in this video. Oh, gosh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this, is just the, this is just the intro. So... So, yeah. Um, so do you want to describe what this work is or do you want me to go into it this time? Yeah, well, I was going to let's talk a little bit about the whole concept of aphorisms, because the, um, in Renaissance and medieval astrology, they, they really liked aphorisms. They're just sort of a short, pithy saying. And, you know, as you see, as we'll work through this, they range from these very broad philosophical statements to some very specific astrological technique. And it was a, a pretty uh, standard way of sort of, of uh, passing on astrological knowledge and teaching. And there's a lot of different sets. I mean, this is just probably the most famous set of aphorisms, but there's, you know, I, I, you know offhand, I can think of like three or four other ones. Um, and um, this is, the, there's two translations um, on my website. If you search Liber Fructus or Centiloquium, then on Renaissance Astrology, you can, when I come up, I think I looked on Google today, it was like number four. I'm, I'm sinking. I used to be number one, but um, you can, you can take a look at these translations that we're working from. So we'll pretty much focus on two different translations. It's Ashmand and Partridge, I think are the two that we're going to, that are on my website that we'll focus on. Um, and so um, I think that um, the first issue that we should probably talk about is this whole question of authorship. And I think that that's, um, you know, something that's immediately kind of a block for, for moderns. Um, the, the standard scholarly approach is to look at this. And, and again, I mentioned this on my website. There's a, uh, a, a academic named Richard LeMay, and he wrote a paper, and I think pretty conclusively demonstrated based on the textual evidence and the, you know, the, 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 the technique and things like that, that this was actually written in the, in the, uh, in the about a thousand, I think, in the, the or the tenth century rather, um, by an Arab astrologer, as opposed to the attribution which is to Ptolemy. Ptolemy is a very famous uh, classical astrologer, like second or third century. Wrote the Tetra Biblos, um, and um, so that's very important for the academics because the academics are like you know their conception is that the, everything was created by a specific person and we want to check the authorship and then we want to check how it was passed down. We want to get the most accurate. And really what we're looking for is sort of, you know, it's like a literary derivation and, and that's what we're focused on. You know, we're focused on the, cause obviously it's all bullshit. 
I mean, you know, we're not going to pay any attention to the astrology itself because, but we are interested in the social meaning of it and, you know, why anyone would be foolish enough to believe in astrology and things like that. And, you know, the, the, how it was passed down and the, and the literary side of it. So the fact that it wasn't actually written by Tom Lee, that's just the end of the story for the academics. They're like, oh my God, this is just garbage. It's a forgery. It's pseudo pseudonymous. It's, it's, you know, they have all sorts of nasty terms for that. Whereas traditionally, a lot of stuff was sort of floating around and you'd stick somebody's name on it. And, you know, we sort of thought they wrote it or sort of, it didn't really matter so much. I mean, it was more of like in the style of, I was thinking about one thing I, I've mentioned before is like fan fiction, right? It's almost like fan fiction, you know, they've taken, they're in the style of that or the studio or something like that. So they just had a much looser view of it. And, you know, some people it's, oh yeah, Tom Lee wrote it, but that's less of their focus. And also the other, the other thing I would say about it is that my interest in this is, I think it's interesting that it's written by Abu Jafar or whatever in the 10th century, but really what I'm focused on is the, the astrological technique and the contents. You know, is this something that's going to be useful to me as an astrologer? Is it giving me, you know, useful information? Is it making useful points? Is it true? As opposed to, you know, exactly what the derivation is of it. It's sort of like a cookbook. You say, oh, this is not the 1930. There was an interpolation of the pancake recipe into the 1932, you know, joy of cooking. And it's really the 1972 joy of cooking. And therefore, that's very problematic. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, have you ever made the pancakes? No, I just study. I study cookbooks, but I never cook, which seems a little odd. But apparently it doesn't seem odd to the academics that study astrology and magic. Um, so that's what I would say about this is that it is 10th century, most likely it is medieval, but it's a very useful source has a lot of interesting stuff in it. And um, so did you want to add to that? I was just, well, yeah, no, I, I'm totally going to jump in and, and ramble some myself about it. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. So one of the, one of the things that's really great about it though, is how widely spread this was and how much it was used by our medieval and Renaissance forebears. So we practice a kind of astrology that they practice practiced. So their sources, no matter who they're attributed to, really need to come into play. It seems to be something that we discuss and something that we really dig into as astrologers. Kind of like the whole Aristotle the th thing, where as Aristotle wrote lots of books of astrology. Well, not really, but everyone thought he did. And with Jaff uh, Jaffar being ascribed as Ptolemy, I mean, I have my own personal um, takes on uh, pseudographia and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm a big fan of Dionysius, who is now um, this, this evil plat uh, platonic um, influencer on the Christian church, uh, who is now pseudo Dionysius, the root of all evil, if you, if you ask certain sects about that. So I, I definitely want to jump into this because it's something that was used and it's full of useful information, no matter who wrote it. Yeah. And so that, I just, like I said, it's one of those things is like, I think that the, the two, the skill in Charybdis, you know, of the, of, of traditional astrology, I think is one being sort of new agey, fluffy, bunny, modern, make it all up, learn it in 15 minutes style. The other is to try to be an academic. And both of those are going to get you off base because an academic studies about astrology, right? And, 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 and officially they don't think it works. So I don't, you're really not going to learn a lot of useful practical information about being an astrologer from, a, from, a, from an academic. Now, it's useful to understand the historical context. It's useful not to be credulous about things. You know, I, I've met Masons that really thought that, for example, that Solomon was wearing a Masonic apron at the building of the temple kind of thing. It's like, no, that you need to be a little more sophisticated than that. But nevertheless, you know, and that's the fundamentalist view. The fundamentalist view is that everything in the Bible is literally true. You know, it's like, well, no, but it doesn't mean it's false either. I mean, that's, if you take the literally true as the truth value, then you get stuck into that debate, whereas you can step out of that. Same thing with this is that really what we're interested in is, is it, does it work? Is it useful to us? You know, is, can we cook pancakes with this cookbook? And definitely we can, there's lots of useful stuff in there. So that's what I would say about it is that, you want to have, I like the rigor of academia, but in a, pra pra you know, in a practical, uh, in a practical way. So I think I am looking forward to doing this uh, with you and seeing, you know, having a dialogue about it. And, um, you know, just, it's, it's also just this, this older style, you know, I think the modern style is a five minute video. That's how people learn nowadays. This, that's, they use aphorisms. So it's just interesting to kind of key into the 
different styles of, of, of learning and, um, you know, and, and, and teaching that were used in the, in the medieval and Renaissance astrology. Well, the other really interesting part about using aphorisms is there's a, there's a woodcut, which I will totally post in the video at some point. Um, and it is, I, I believe it's called distilling anecdote to wisdom where it has this alchemist sitting there um, distilling pages of books in the library into wisdom. But one of the things that's really cool about the aphorisms is they're usually fairly specific and you have to think about them and then you apply them to all kinds of places. So it really is kind of this, this spirit flavor of knowledge, which is universal and which has many, many applications, but you have to get to the core of the aphorism in order to do that. Now, some of them are just setting a foundation, but a lot of them, when you get into the, the technical details of them, they're teaching you principles that you need to apply in many, many different ways in many, many different places, but they require that you be smart enough to figure it out yourself. They do not hold your hand with this stuff. And I, I kind of like that because it becomes a challenge and a puzzle. And I think that for a lot of us who dive into the occult, we're really looking for that. We talk about things like blinds being all over grimoires where, oh, well, that's a blind to mislead you. Well, with this, it's really a puzzle challenging you to understand it. And if, if you just parroted the aphorisms, you wouldn't get nowhere if, if you didn't actually think about them. And I find that appealing. I think that, um, you know, it's, um, there is this, this, you know, Picatrix says specifically, for example, and I think Agrippa does too, that they scatter it, you know, the knowledge throughout it. I don't think the astrologers had that so much. I think that what's difficult about this typically is that you need, you know, people are coming from a modern worldview. And so they don't have the, uh, an understanding, they don't think like, you know, a, a Renaissance astrologer. They don't have the, 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 the philosophical or unconscious background. And then they don't have the knowledge. And so that's the thing too. It's like, because I read this stuff, I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, it's really not, you know, it's not that difficult for me, but I've been steeping in this for the past 30 years. So um, I think that what's difficult about it is that, you know, it, it just, it's just a new way of thinking and a new, uh, a lot of difficult information. And so I don't think that the aphorisms were deliberately, you know, um, hard to understand. I think they were as clear as they could get. It's just that it's hard for us to understand it, um, you know, without, without the background. 